culture has been around putting will will be f- fairly familiar with you, but there's going to be a lot of, I think, you know, guys that won't know you. You know, the average golfer may not be that familiar with your work. I mean, obviously, I've, I've known you for a number of years, um, and I've just kind of introduced you to, to, um, to you know, the people that are looking in tonight. But um, Christian was the, or is the inventor of the Sam Put Lab, which I would say, I don't know how long ago that is now. How, how long has that been around? It's about 17 years. 17 years, okay. And I, I would say, I'm not just blowing smoke up Christian's backside here, but he's probably one of the most influential pieces of technology, I think, that's uh, really pushed putting instruction on in the last, you know, 30, 40 years. So, um, but as well as being, a, you know, a putting coach yourself, an inventor, Christian has also been a researcher uh, um, in what what's the exact... To, what's the exact research area? Again, remind me. Neuropsychology and movement control. Yeah. Okay. You said it better than I could. So, um, yes. Yeah, so, obviously, really chuffed to have you on tonight. And, and the kind of one of the things that I wanted to, to do tonight was to talk specifically about the yips. I know through your research over the last 20 years in the Sandpot Lab. You've got some really interesting insights to the yips, and I think it's something that a lot of golfers actually, you know, struggle with without, without realizing. So when I was kind of putting together a list of people that I think, you know, that I thought would be good to talk to on these uh, putting socials, I clearly thought of you. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, first question really. I think, I think we just get stuck. I've got a bunch of questions here. We've taken some questions from social media over the last couple of days that people wanted to ask. But I've got a, a bunch of questions that I want to put to you. And the first one really is that you often hear the term focal dystonia associated with the yips, or people you know, call it a focal dystonia. And you know, many golf coaches and, and certainly many players don't really know what a focal dystonia is. So I thought, you know, could, could you describe what that is and what your thoughts are? whether the yips kind of falls into that category. Yes, so focal dystonia is basically the field I was working in as I was doing clinical work, and it is, it is a neurological disease. So it's a really hard neurological disease. Normally only affecting one limb or one joint. And dystonia means it's kind of a dystonic cramping. So dystonia, focal dystonia is a focal cramping of one of your joints. Yeah. And this is normally a problem after brain damage, for example. The, the, the problem with this focal dystonia is that it's a really tough neurological disease and the um, prevalence is normally less than 0.1 percent of the population. All right, right. My missus so must be unlucky. I'm sure she's got one. So if you have 20 percent of yippers, it's very unlikely that they might have yeah. because that just, it doesn't make too much sense. So why do we think it is something like focal dystonia? I think it resembles to focal dystonia because it's kind of a cramp or jerk. Yeah. So it resembles a focal dystonia, but the clinical evidence for focal dystonia is is not there. Okay. So, and we will talk about the task afterwards, but yes. just from this perspective, if you go to a doctor and you have a symptom, he would just grab the disease which is most similar of yeah. what what you show as a symptom. And then you put a tag on it. Yeah. And actually, I can just tell you, I've seen people with focal dystonia, and YIPS is not a focal dystonia. So what, what would be a good example of focal dystonia that someone might come across in you know, their everyday life? Well, focal dystonia, for example, is if the hand is... So for, if the, 
it's kind of a co-contraction where all the muscles are active at the same time. Yeah. It's it's a cramp and normally the joints are in extreme positions. So it either goes to extension of So once you try to, for example, grasp, the hand gets into a abnormal position and gets stuck. That's the stone. Okay. And basically, this is a dysfunction which you can not overcome easily. Because yeah. once you grasp, yeah. it comes. And it doesn't matter what you want to grasp, because it's just the inability to grasp. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, like the head that the head turns to one side to the maximum, and you're no longer able to bring the head back. This is also dystonia. Okay, so from your perspective, then, with an understanding obviously with the science behind these sort of conditions, how would you best describe what a yip would be? Well, I think from the very beginning, as we were researching, so we had a lot of patients, and they were also classified as focal dystonia, and we, we thought, okay, they are classified as focal dystonia, but basically, if you look carefully, it's not a general dystonia because it affects the task. And this what, so we were first actually doing research on that in the in the nineties. We started doing that. So, for example, you have focal dystonia in different disciplines like musicians, like yeah. writing, like surgery, and in many many sports. But the difference to a true dystonia is that these focal dystonias, which are affecting a task, can be modulated or can be modified. So if you have writer's cramp, and you grab a pen and your hand starts cramping, then a typical uh, mechanism in writer's cramp is that if, for example, you turn the head, the, the pen around, that there is no more. Yeah. To be put on the paper, the cramp is gone. So we have a lot of phenomena, which is rather than task-specific movement disturbance, which is task-specific. So it's very dependent on not focal to a joint, but focal to a task, and that's something which is pretty new. And this was a development in the 90s where we found out that many of these categorizations of focal dystonia are actually task specific and that's not the inability of the motor system it's linked to a specific aspect or attribute of the task okay what would what what are generally the underlying mechanisms that would bring something on like this within a specific task yeah so, so actually, for for a clinical perspective, it's hard to understand why this is possible. Yeah. So, we had, so if, I, if I tell you extremes, we had patients, and they were not able to write a specific number. They could write the one, the three, the four, the five, the six, but they couldn't write the two. And you would say, well, this is kind of psychological. Something is wrong psychological wise, but. Then you hear the history, and for them the two is something specific because they put more attention onto the two because they didn't like the two they've written from the early childhood. There was a reason that they don't like the two. And we will talk about yips later in, in thirty. So yeah. specific means um, it is relative to a specific attribute or aspect of the task, and we would say it has to do something with control, with focus of attention, and with precision, and basically you you are more involved as you normally would be into this specific task because, well, I don't want to go into too much of detail of motor, motor control, but um, just in general way. If we have learned something, it becomes a very subconscious. Yeah, yeah. It's cut even out of control. So what is a good golf swing? What is a good golf shot? It's very subconscious. We don't control all the muscles. 
specific reasons have time or the attitude to, to come back to control, although it has been automated before. These tasks are perfect. So, I mean, there's a very good question here, because it, I think it's pertinent as well to what you're talking about right now, but someone's asked, how much is it physical and how much is it mental? Now, obviously, through a, con you know, you're talking about the, the guy who can't write the number two, then you'd say that's not a physical condition. It's essentially, you know, some conditioning that's creating a, a mental incapacity Possibly, isn't it? I mean, what would your thoughts be there as to defining it as a physical or mental mechanism? Yes, I think it's 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 not physical, but it's neither mental only. It's more strategy oriented. So the problem of the brain is that the brain is connected. All the different areas are connected. So while you move. You activate very different areas of the brain, although you wouldn't recognize. Yeah. And this is the reason why we talk about movement behavior. And behavior is a lot of your attitude, yeah. a lot of interpretation of the object, causes and consequences. So there's a lot of things going on in motor behavior, which is much more than a motor program, which is also not really mental, because mental would be just this. The cognitive state. So it's something in between where cognition and physics come together yeah. and develop strategy. So it's more a strategical problem. So you understand the task in the wrong way, and for a specific reason, you start becoming more conscious because there is normally not a reason to be more conscious. And now, if we know that it is a problem of becoming more conscious, then we also understand why it's affecting the tasks where you need to be as precise as or as accurate as possible because the more accurate you want to be the more you tend to become conscious again yes yeah yeah no i can i can certainly relate to that i mean the, the interesting thing that i found from experience is that you can have guys with fantastic technique that generate the yips and you can also see guys who have really poor technique gener generate the yips. So it's always kind of been a puzzle for me as to what where it's being generated from, what are the underlying mechanisms, and trying to sort of truly appreciate those. There was a question there that um, someone asked, can you get the yips in the full swing? And I think it was well documented many years ago that Ian Baker Finch, I think, had a, a yip with his driver, and I've heard a couple of players talk about having yip like symptoms on their driver. But why would you say the putting stroke is more prominent than other parts of the game? I think it's fair to say more people experience the yips in putting than what they do for other parts of the game. Why would that be? Well, absolutely. So, so I, I would say it, it is not only putting, it's also the short game, chipping. So actually the first student I I worked in my career and God was Hank Haney on his chipping years. So this was in 2003 and he then supported us in bringing St. Patrick to the market because he suffered severely from full swing and chipping yips. And in, uh, in chipping, it was more the forearms and in, in the full swing, it's in the hands, it's more in the, the more proximal joint which is the, the, the longer joints, which is, which is the trunk or the knee, even on the hips. I've seen many players having hips, hips, knee, hips. Yeah. Well, now the question is, why is it affecting putting and not the full swing? I think um, it is always affecting tasks where you have a little bit of time to monitor and the more distal you are, the more it requires time to take over control. So, and this is true for all the sports. If you think about darts, you have the dart in yeah. your hand. If you think about throwing in baseball, you have the ball in your hand. If you think about tennis, it's not affecting the game, it's affecting the surf, where you, again you have the ball. So, 
all the time where you can prepare for the task, then while executing the task, you are able to take over control because it's kind of a little bit slow. Parts we say they are closed and open tasks. Closed task is everything under your control. Open task, like a soccer game, you need to react. The more you the more need to react, action. the more you are able to take over control, the more you are in Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, it's definitely a, a closed skill, isn't it, in that sense? So, so, obviously, you know, good players with great technique can develop it and, you know, through, it, you know, too much of a conscious involvement, maybe trying to over-control. Now, in terms of some players never really develop competency in the technique and never get to that stage where it's, you know, the, you know, subconsciously competent, and are always perhaps having to be consciously aware of their technique to de develop, you know, functional technique. So, would there be an argument that that player, who through having possibly poor technique and a lot of cognitive input to manage it, would there be an argument that that player could, you know, cascade in the same kind of direction and develop it as a consequence? Well, I think not necessarily. So I've seen a lot of amateurs, and we, we might discuss about Putlet later. So in St. Putlet, you see the problems before they break out. You see in one aspect, which is face rotation, you can see that they react to impact. And once you see that the player reacts to impact, meaning that he doesn't go through impact. So at impact, the face angle is doing something which you would normally not do, meaning that you are involved at some control level in taking care of face angle at impact. And this is what we can see in the face rotation rate graph in Zimbabwe. So we can see it in players before it breaks out. You can also see it in amateurs, and they don't even know. And at this point, there is not really a problem, it's just a poor outcome. But once you recognize that something is wrong, then it becomes different, and then technique plays a role. So once you recognize that there's something wrong, and you have a very complicated technique, or you have technical flaws, then this is creating more and more problems. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, you try to solve something which is very it's more it, it's easier to manage but once you recognize that something is wrong and you have technical problems it's exploding faster okay all right um i mean i mean because that's always a, i would say you know even with coaches i, I know some coaches i've spoke to about the years they would argue that it's generated from by technique, you know, it's almost like a bottom-up approach. But what you're talking about from your experience and research is more of a, a top-down, um, you know, more of a, a cognitive aspect to that, which is ultimately then, you know, creating that condition. Okay. Um, so, would, so certainly, um, we we don't we don't really know why in a specific player. It comes to a critical level. So the normal story is that they got into a problem, and they wanted to get rid of the problem, and there was a certain stage in the development where it got out of control. Yeah. And now I've talked to Yippers, and they say, well, I have the Yips, but I can live with it, and it's on a low level. I know that something is wrong, but I don't care. But for some, it just becomes extreme. It becomes extreme. And we don't really know why in some of the player it develops in such a bad way. And it certainly can have to do with a mental state, which is anxiety and perfectionism, but it also can do it can have to do with physical conditions like problems, technical problems, or kind of behavioral aspects such as stroke which is a little bit 
pushing or, or blocking. So we, we don't really know this. I think it's kind of a, a mixture of different ingredients. Yeah. And if it becomes subcritical, it can just explode. And then once, and that's the problem of it, once you are over that critical point, it's very, very difficult to come back. Because if I have players, I, I work, for example, with German national teams. And these are very many young players. They are 14, 15. I see these problems at a very early stage. And they say, OK, let's just try to do something which is making me a little bit more subconscious. And then it's very easy to get rid of this problem. But if you have a, if you have a yipper, it's really tough. It's very tough because it's kind of a trauma. And even before they grab a putter, they are in trouble. So it's, it's really very deeply into their motor system. Well, someone um, today on, on social media, Craig Foster, he, he actually asked a couple of interesting questions. And you mentioned there that you, you um, do some work with the German national squads, and in particular, sort of some of the younger players. Um, and Craig asked, what's the youngest player that you've ever seen with a yip? The youngest player I've had was 10 years old. 10 years. Yeah, and, can, and it can be, yeah, I think it is. So normally, so why would we think it affects players who have a long history? I think it affects more players with a long history because they have reached a higher level of automaticity and they would then also more recognize that something goes wrong because of their experience. But I've seen 10 year old kids and they, 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 they have the yips, so it, it does. So there was a time where they even said, well, it cannot affect younger players also at certain handicaps. But I have, we've done studies at the University of Munich, so we just grabbed 20 students. Or we also had, by the way, a study of history of golf, we found 20% yippers. Bringing in yips from other sports such as tennis or, or squash. So um, it, it, it seems to be a more general problem of the task, which is putting. Standing over the ball, and you want to be accurate, but you should not control it. And that's from our behavioral aspect not too easy to do because if we want to if we need to be accurate let's say you have a, a cup and the cup is filled up to the very top with liquid so you don't want to spill it mm. you say okay the pot is like a cup of hot water don't spill it but don't but i would then ask you don't care just do it we would very naturally take over control, we would increase grip pressure, we would slow down the movement, we would visually control how we see the other as the ingredient which is very naturally driving us into a situation where we are not really able to let it go. And so this is also the reason why, as you know, there are so many different attempts to increase in the preparation phase the ability to mentally lower the level of brain activity with focus band and all these yeah. things. Okay, good. So we 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 know that a variety of different techniques can do, you know, good and bad can develop the it. It's task specific. There's a, a large in, uh, influence through cognition. I mean, from a psychological perspective, what are the sort of psychological tra traits that you would see that would be maybe predispose someone to developing the it? Well, I think um, as far as the so Bernard Langer is a very good example, a very highly high self-monitoring and I think that's normally the best condition to develop the yips. So it's kind of you have a very high 
high level of skill, but you tend to monitor yourself. And as we know, these complicated movements are not under our control. At the highest level, you don't really have a clue actually in detail what you do. If you have a musician playing the piano at a very high level, he is the music. He doesn't control the music. He yeah. is music. And so the better you are an artist in music, the more you are the music itself, the less you control it. Now, if on the other hand, you tend to self-monitor yourself and something goes wrong, you have a tendency to interfere or to, to just become conscious again. And now the problem with the brain is that these motor programs are stored in the motor cortex and your conscious mind is somewhere else and you start to do now two different things at the same time execute a movement like walking down steps at a high speed at the same time you want to make sure that you meet the steps perfectly with your foot and that's impossible you cannot do that yeah so the break the more and more you try to take over control, the more you yeah. lose connection to the motor program and it gets getting stuck. So, you know, the, there's some, you know, interesting sort of research out there in terms of skill acquisition, whether skills are better learned implicitly or explicitly, you know, so explicit would be quite, you know, cognitively structured and um, implicit skill would be maybe something that would learn more through discovery, less conscious processing, stuff like that. From your experience, have you found any predisposition for how a player may have developed the, the putting over the years and then the impact that could have in terms of developing a year? Well, that's a very, very interesting point. I cannot really answer this question, but I know that if you have a person or a player and he says, I found out that something is wrong and I started working hard on it, which is your training strategy. Yeah. This it doesn't help. If you if you if you have the ability to forget and to trust, you're you're much better off. So we have seen a lot of players, in particular in musicians, you find that, that if something is wrong they hate it. And so, and this has to do with their normal training, training approach. Always try to control what's going on. A less playful training approach, where you vary and where you are learning a little bit of yeah. Yeah, I mean, you are less in danger, probably. But but that's a very very interesting question because um, this would be preventive. Yeah. Yeah, through how you would, you know, the conditions you would allow people to learn skills in, if you could, uh, you know, create better conditions, they'd be potentially less likely to, to, to break down. One of the, from my experience, of having worked with different yippers, some of the concepts that they have, you know, everyone works on the technique, don't they? I mean, you know, as a golfer, we've all worked on aspects of our game. But sometimes I'll see an issue when a player's worked on particular concepts which aren't particularly good concepts for them. They don't make sense. They could be wrong for that golfer. And then there's whether there's some internal battle of trying to do something which isn't very functional and then the over-controlling element as well. And you see kind of a, a breakdown, you know, uh, subsequently. Um, so I'm just going to sort of follow on to one of the, the other questions that I've had here. Um, obviously, one of the things that I found particularly useful as a coach was to be able to start to identify someone who had a predisposition or, you know, visibly had a, had a yip. Um, and that was the social. From your experience as the designer, and, and no one knows the system better than you, what are ways that you can identify if someone has a yip? Someone asked this question earlier on, but how would you use Sam Putlab to identify if someone had the yip? Because a lot of golfers have a yip and they don't know. 
Yes, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe I try to switch the camera and, and to show you a little bit how it would look like in black. Because this also explains a little bit of where it's coming from. Yeah. You can see that. So yeah. If you look at the lower right, you see the phase fa rotation rate. And this is the rate of rotation where in the center there's a small stripe which is impact. And you see this kind of oscillation upwards. And these are five or seven parts of a, of, a, of a tour player. And what you see here, there is kind of an oscillation that this is already a reaction to impact. And if the oscillation is going upwards, it's a block to keep the... You don't really see it. So here, after impact, the face angle is a little bit more flattened over time. That's hard to see. But curve has this bump, and this is already a block. Now, a block is not really a problem. It just shows us that this player reacts to impact in a way that he potentially stiffens a little bit the joints, probably, of the hand, a little bit more stiffness in the joints, to get the face a little bit more square through impact because the face would normally close through impact at a constant rate. So this block is a subconscious strategy of a lot of face. At this point, there is not a problem. And if I show you, can you see always on the right side from top to bottom, again, two players, and they do blocks or they do kind of they show reaction phase rotation rate and impact which become inconsistent and once you see that these blocks are becoming inconsistent you know that something tends to get out of control and i would say what you see here are two players and they are not yet yippers but they develop the hips at this point in time and at this level you can still cure it more easily because they have not yet attached or signed anxiety with it or there is not yet a trauma. It's still at a level where they don't they do too much interference. We're losing your sound there, Christian. Okay, can you still hear me? I can now, yeah. Okay. So if you if you go down um, you can see that it's becoming more severe. And then, if we look at the right side, everything completely out of control. Again, losing your sound. Maybe it depends. Can you hear me again? Just, yeah. Okay, it's just because I see if I, if I move the camera, the sound is off. Okay, I try to let it like that. Okay. And, and this is the best way to. We, we've done a study uh, with a Mayo Clinic, actually, in Arizona. And we combined it with EMG and brain function, everything. And it, it turned out that an abdomen with cell part lab was the most sensitive measure to identify it. And then you could see that all the time you see this jerking or twitching, it is associated with co-contraction in the forearms. So there's a very clear picture we can see now. Yeah. What it is, potentially where it's coming from, and how it develops. Yeah. So interesting question here, and I don't have them on the practice point green. Is that normal? Well, it's, it tends to be normal, although I would argue that on the putting green, on the practice area, it's just subcritical. But he probably adopts the same strategies, but it's not breaking out at this point. So that's kind of not generalized in a way 
that he has kind of a phobia. That many Yipnas have a phobia. They develop a phobia even if they see the pata. Or I have seen Yipas and they see a pata and they start shaking. Yeah. Even before grabbing the pata. And it, it's weird. So yeah. they, they develop a problem. So if you are only having it in the course of the reputing ring, then you already have these problems, but they are still in a level where it's subcritical if there is no pressure. Yeah. Pressure amplifies the problem, or anxiety amplifies the problems. But on the long run, it will generalize. Yeah. Well, so basically, Will, um, just stick to practicing, mate. Don't go to the course. Um, right, so another question. Most golfers, you know, a large percent of the population are right-handed. Most people play golf right-handed. Um, I don't think I can recall someone that's had a year that's in the non-dominant hand. So for me, from my experience, most, um, most yippers would be in the dominant hand, which is the trail hand. Why would that be the case, and is that something that you found yourself, or you know, is, am I just unfortunate in that, in that effect? Yeah, that's also an interesting point, and I, I discussed this a lot with neurological doctors, and um, it's a little bit difficult to explain. Actually, we have done experiments where we played with the left hand and the right hand into both directions, so we have and the right forehand part, but the right left hand part. Yeah. The direction of the left hand. And then we have a left hand part to the right, which is a back hand, and then a left hand part with forehand. Yeah. So we tried all the four directions, and only the right forehand is affected. So you if you would turn around the hand on the putter right hand and play with the right hand a big hand part the yips is gone it's just amazing if you, if you have a chance to do that so it's not only the right hand only it's the right hand only if the front side is pointing to the target okay so then what that so obviously that, that that gives an insight that gives an insight into how grip changes can help so, so, I mean, just to kind of move on a little bit there, because I think one of the things that I want to try and get out of this this chat is not obviously to understand where it comes from. So we've talked about, well, what is the yip? You know, where does it come from? There's a large, large cognitive element to it. It's, it can be task-specific. So you could have it in your putting, and, and you could be fine in your chipping or your driving. Um, we can identify it. Things like Sam Put Lab help us identify it. It, it can be quite common. You can even see it with your eyes. With some people, it's obviously very, very evident. But with the, you could, we can get to it before it becomes too evident with devices like Sam Putler. But probably the most important question that I would ask tonight, which I think would help the 116 yippers that are currently watching, is how do we fix it? So from your experience... You know, what are the what have been the best approaches that you found in order to help a player with the yip? Yes. Um, so first of all, unfortunately, it's very difficult to cure it completely. Get away from the self monitoring. So it's much more easy. It, it doesn't need to be an expert or a coach, but if we have two and one is kind of your counterpart to talk about your experiences or your that, that, that's very helpful. So our approach is kind of a little bit two-folded. So first of all, we would use the task specifically, task specifically yeah. to start at a level where you're not affected with the practice. So because if you take away the ball or if you kind of do things to the ball that you wouldn't move, for example, or sometimes we use kind of velcros the ball sticks to the putter face and then the yips is gone. So we do a lot of these exercises where it is still okay and then we try to step by step come back to a normal part. So we have kind of a list of 20 different drills which modulate the problem. So this is one we start 
start kind of in hierarchical order. So don't try to play the perfect part if you work on yips. Just make it easy. Take away the hole. Maybe not even a T, maybe not even a distance. Just try to just move the ball somewhere. Start with a simple task. Then try to come back to where you were. And then we have all the different mental and physical drills which would reduce the relevance of impact to the ball. So it's pretty important to get rid of impact from your brain to cure the lips. So from so do you see impact being a, a fundamental issue? Absolutely. Everything is synchronized so, impact. Okay. So with some players I've taken away impact. So I've changed the task as you sort of described there. But you could still see that the, the tremor was prevalent. You know, even if you took away the uh, um, the outcome, you manipulated the constraints of the task, um, you even take away the golf ball, you could still see that the tremor was there. Is that Would that be because it's so deeply ingrained? Exactly. So you need to go one level deeper. So they still see it as a putt. Yeah. So, for example, take away the putter and take a broom. So as long, even if you close your eyes, as long as you see it as a putt, and you are used to the putt where there is a ball, if you are still in the putting mode, it's still there. So you need to get to a level, and sometimes you need to go very deep. Sometimes I turn the putter around, and you grab it at the face, and you hit the ball with it. Yeah, well, with the last guy, we went and played snooker. That's how far away we have to get from it. Um, yeah. Okay, so... Next question then is going back. You, obviously, you you manipulating task. You're taking away some of the outcome. How would you describe? Because you just touched on it before. But for me, you, you and we see now. I mean, like 20 years ago, if you had if you didn't have a conventional grip, you'd be you know thought of as being a little bit crazy. But we see so many different grips and hand positions now. And you touched upon that research that you have success in terms of managing the yips by changing the hand position. So what's the mechanism involved that's allowing someone to overcome that tremor just by purely changing the position of predominantly the trail hand? Yeah, so uh, let me put it that way. So normally the right hand, the dominant hand, is the boss. And you need to just... So you need to just take this away. So the, left, the right hand is the slave. And all the compensation grips, they just reduce the influence of the right hand onto your back. Sometimes you don't even really touch. So it depends a little bit on the, on the level of the problem, how much you need to reduce the, 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 the relevance of the right hand in your stroke. Sometimes it's enough to do something like a regripping just before you start. That's a very, very good drill. You do regripping, and then while gripping, you put the left hand first, and then you put the right hand just onto the putter without really gripping. You just put it onto the putter, and then you start the putt. So this is for, I would say, 20, 30 percent of the yippers already very successful. So just even if they use a normal grip, so the regripping just before they go to not allow the hand to really grip it. But, but sometimes you need to use a grip where the right hand doesn't even have the chance to do anything to the putter because you just put it yeah. somewhere in between where you can maybe move it, but you have no influence on direction or face hand because you just... So just because we're getting a couple of questions here, this is primarily right-handed golfers who tend to, you know, the yips manifest themselves mainly in the dominant hand, which is the right-handed for, for right-handed golfers. But you, you can get a yip in the left hand. Yip in the right hand? Yeah. I have seen yippers and they had yips in both hands because they had it for quite a long time and then both hands started to work as one. 
but it all starts with the right hand. And so normally, if I cure it, I try to cure the right hand. That's yeah. Okay. Between and left hand, as we don't really know because we don't have too much. But irrespective of left or right hand, normally it is coming from one hand, and this is the hand you need to cure. Okay. Good. Right. So we've got. We get, we get kicked out in about eight minutes. Um, so what I've got a few questions here just from the, the audience that I just want to put to you really just to, um, just to cover before we get, uh, before we go. Um, right, there we go. So how, and this was quite a good question actually. I saw this before, but you know, how often would you say you see the yips at tour level? So, like uh, elite level golf, how 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 often would you say that you see someone who struggles, whether knowingly or or not knowingly, they suffer from a yip? Well, potentially, if you see a golfer and he's changing the grip all the time, I think there's something. Um, and well, on tour level. We don't see it too often. I would say maybe five out of hundred. In amateurs, I see much more. Um, so five five percent of all players would have some degree of a tremor. Would have something, yeah, at, at a low level. But they, sometimes, so I, I, I had to players and I said, how would you rate your your budding? And they say, yeah, I know I have a problem with with direction. Yeah. So they wouldn't say I'm a yipper, but they know that something is not right. Okay. Yeah. So a good question here. Someone um, has asked, what, what if a player had a tremor in daily life? Do you, do you see that carry over into, into putting where that, that could create a yip having a tremor? So the problem with the tremor is if you have tremor in daily life, you already have kind of an input. Yeah sensory input and, and the tremor also you, you tend to also control the tremor because it's sometimes it, it doesn't really help so you already have opened this kind of pathway yes so if you have a tremor you are much more conscious and you you are much more vulnerable and, and this is yeah that's just I think, hard luck really, that's just hard luck okay yeah. um but still, Still with a tremor, you can just do exactly the same by more focusing on the flow and all this stuff, and counting and smoothing down. So I had, uh, I had a question here today, which someone had a, it was a direct message actually, but um, they had the yips and they changed to a claw, which they seeing that they had conquered it, but they've come back. How could I conquer it again? Yes. So first of all, the claw doesn't cure your basic problem, it circumvents the problem. Yeah. So it would still adopt the same control mechanism to the part of the claw at first step. But the, again, the claw can tend to be tight. So you need to just relax the claw. And if you have a relaxed claw, it's normally not too bad. But, but the problem is that with the complain, com compensation group, you, you don't really cure the, the true problem. You just circumvent it. So it can come back at a certain point in time where even with the compensation group, you still try to take over control again. So you should do both things at the same time. Reduce all your mental interference and then use a compensation group at the same time. Would it, would it be right to say that you never know if you've ever cured it? Everything that you do is circumventing it. Well, I, I, I would say um, there is no way of curing it because you have it, but you can perfectly live with it. Yeah. Because it's just, well, like a bad habit, and sometimes it might even come. Yeah. But it's not really the problem. So the problem in yips is not that you have the problem is that you're not able to con control it. The yeah. more you want to control it, the more worse it becomes. So kind of being able to just... Okay. Um, I thought this was actually one of the best questions.
questions, quite insightful questions I received today. How much does cluttered design potentially influence a year? That's also a pretty good point. I think it depends very much on your attitude. So if you are tending to, uh, I would say, control freak, yeah? So someone who is trying to take over control over a part and monitoring everything. So the bigger the face, the more lines, the more shapes, the more you see actually, the more you would tend, the more, the more you would feed your system. So. So for, for some players, it might help to use a pattern design, which is very pure. Yeah. At the same time, we know that what you see with the eye is pretty important. So in any case, you should try to follow this quiet eye philosophy that you really calm down the eye and then you get a, a blurred vision. And yeah. then you, throughout the pattern, you don't see anything. Basically, it's just like shut. I, and then I, the, the design, it's becoming less important. Overall weights, the dead weights, head weights, um, you know, these high MOI designs. You know, we know research shows us that players are applying torque to the club at a subconscious level. Um, so they're reacting to what, how, you know, how that club's moving. So I'm sure as, there's a big influence at times from the control perspective, subconsciously, um, through certain designs. I think that's engaging the player at a level that they might not even be aware about. You know, if we're talking about the Sam Putlab showing us patterns which the player isn't aware about, then it would be wrong to assume that some putter designs may be detrimental to a certain player because of that hidden talk that they're experiencing. So. Right, well, I'm frightened about getting kicked off here. Um, one final question. Um, I'm not sure we can answer this, but um, this came in. Help, I'm desperate. Any help appreciated. That was by Mike Kansky. Don't think we can answer that. Don't think we've got time today. Um, but what I did want to say was, Christian, I, I know you're a busy man, um, but I just wanted to say thank you for coming on tonight and, and, and um, giving giving us your insight, sharing your experience. Uh, I know um, you've, you've been involved at this level for a long time and uh, your, your experience is gold. So thank you very much. Thanks everybody for, for tuning in. Um, hopefully um, you've got a few nuggets to take away, whether you're a coach or whether you're a, you're a player. Hopefully there's some stuff that you can go and help your students with or help your own golf. Next week, um, Following on from this topic of discussing the yips, I'm really pleased to say that we've got Thomas Bjorn who's going to join us. Thomas has um, battled the yips um, over a, a number of years and has battled them 